Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 is where we'll begin, and uh, we'll jump around a good bit this evening. So if you're a note taker, get your note takers ready, okay? Matthew chapter 4, um, as we continue our doctrinal study that we've been doing on Wednesday night, and over these last uh, few weeks, been focusing in on the Word of God. Uh, let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer before we get uh, into the Word together this evening. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to this portion of the service, we just want to say thank you uh, again for all that we've heard already, for uh, the praises that have been mentioned, for a time that we can gather with our brothers and sisters and bear one another's burdens and lift up our requests to you. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word tonight, how it speaks to us. Lord, it is living and it's powerful. Lord, uh, giving us all that we need for life and for godliness. And Lord, we thank you because it all comes from you. It's all because of you. As we read in your word this morning, in our quiet time, Lord, how you loved us and you sent your son. Lord, so many have loved darkness rather than light. Oh Lord, we pray that you would take eyes that are blinded and open them up to the beauty and the glory of Christ. Lord, the, the names that are on our list uh, for salvation, Father, we pray for these family members, these loved ones. We pray for those that we will come in contact with this week. Lord, we pray for those who have been, been on our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we know that are without Christ. Lord, we pray for those who perhaps even in our midst tonight or on Sunday morning who has yet to come to know you, yet they're here. Father, we pray that you would move mightily in their life, that you might draw them to yourself. That we might see new birth and new life in Christ. Oh Lord, you know each need here tonight, and so we stop and we ask that you would uh, accomplish your good purposes in your people. Lord, I pray for comfort and strength where it is needed. Pray for grace. Lord, we pray for peace. Lord, you know each need and each heart, and so uh, we just trust you in each one of these uh, situations, the circumstances that we face. Lord, we know that you're working all things together for good, for your glory. And Lord, uh, that doesn't mean that everything is easy. So I pray that through the trials that we would grow, that we would grow in grace and knowledge. Pray just for this time as we open your word tonight that you would prepare our hearts for what you have for us. And Lord, may our love for you and our love for your word grow and increase. Oh Lord, you know uh, what needs to be done here. And so we pray that you would do it in spite of me, in spite of us, for your glory. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. Yeah, we, we live in a world where um, things happen really fast. <laughs> and we expect them to happen really fast. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we, we kind of live in an instant express world. Um, you know, we have instant popcorn <laughs> and, you know, we have express drive throughs And uh, if you want to watch a movie, you don't have to go to the video store. You can just click a button and you can have it on your TV within seconds. And, and there's, there's some, um, you know, there's some, something to be said about that, right? It can be good. And yet, it tends to, to work within us an impatience, right? We tend to, if we don't get what we want and we don't get it right now, we, go, we grow impatient very quickly. Uh, in fact, they did a study of, uh, you know, on the Internet of people, you know, how long will someone wait for, you know, it, it, has this ever happened to you, right? You click a video link and it pulls the video up and you get that little circle. It, Buffering, buffering, buffering. Yeah, and, and so how long will people wait? <laughs> the average length that someone will wait for a video to stop buffering is two seconds before they'll click off. It did not load immediately, and so I'm done with that, and I'm moving on to something else. That's, that's what has happened with us as a culture, right? And, and so <laughs> that kind of thinking can be especially problematic when we translate that 
to our spiritual life. Because things do not work that way in your Christian life. It's not instant, right? I mean, you ever, you ever feel like you're, not, you're just not growing the way you should spiritually? You ever feel like maybe um, you've plateaued a bit in your Christian life or you know, perhaps your relationship with the Lord is not what it used to be? You know, maybe you get frustrated when you look at someone else and you see, man, why am I not growing like them? Or why, you know, why is my spiritual experience not like their spiritual experience? And, and you, know, there, there's, you, you may have lots of different feelings when it comes to this area of your Christian life and spiritual growth in particular. And so tonight we want to focus on that key component uh, that, that brings about spiritual growth and health um, one that is neglected far too often, and that's simply the Bible. <laughs> if you're here tonight and you're saying, you know, why am I not growing the way that I want to? Why am I not experiencing this kind of growth like so-and-so? And, or why, am, why, am, why do I not have the relationship with the Lord? The very first question you should ask yourself is, am I, am I spending time in the Word of God like I should? Right? That, that, you know, so many times I have people coming and they'll ask questions, you know, about, you know, what direction should I go? You know, should I do this or should I do this? Or what should I do about this situation? Or I just don't understand why God's not leading me here. And, and, you know, and the first question I'm going to ask is, well, are you in the Word? Many times they're not. Now, you might be saying, Pastor, we're going to talk about this again? <laughs> you know, we, we, we talk about this all the time. Can't we move on to something more, more significant, more important? And the answer is absolutely not. We, we come back to this again because people desperately need the Word. And, and the sad reality is, is that we have, we have <laughs> un, uncharted access, right? There, there's never been access to the Word of God like we have today, and yet people are not reading it. They're not reading it. According to a study by Lifeway, uh, George Guthrie, uh, he wrote in his book, Read the Bible for Life, he said this, Ask 100 church members if they have read the Bible today, and 84 of them will say no. Ask them if they've read the Bible at least once in the past week, and 68 of them will say no. <laughs> Even more disconcerting, ask those 100 church members if reading or studying the Bible has made any significant difference in the way they live their lives. Only 37 out of 100 will say no. Yes. Now, that's concerning. <laughs> we're talking about church members. We're not talking about lost people. We're not even talking about regular tenders. You know, we're talking about members of the church who say, no, I didn't read the Bible today or this week. or The Bible doesn't really have any significance in my life. And, and that may be you tonight, right? I mean, <laughs> we don't even have 100 people in here. So it's likely that some of you are going to fall into that category of saying, you know, this, you know, that book doesn't really play out. You say, and maybe you hadn't thought through that. Maybe you thought, well, you know, this Bible is important to me. I come to church and I hear it preached. And, but if you're not reading the book for yourself, then you would fall into this category. You know, over the last few weeks, we've identified this book as the very Word of God. Right? It's, it's inspired, it's an error. God is speaking. Last week we talked about the unique power of this Word. You know, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. There's no book like this book. And so if all that we have said about the Bible is true, there's really only one logical conclusion. The Bible is necessary. It's necessary for life, right? We had you turn to Matthew chapter 4. Look at verse 4. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? Now, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3 there. But what do you hear? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word. <laughs> the word of God is necessary for life and for health and for growth. You know, just in the same way that you have daily dietary needs to sustain you Physically, you have daily spiritual needs. God's Word is our very life. That great man of faith, George Mueller, he said this. He said, the vigor of our spiritual life 
will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. What's he saying? He's saying that the, the growth, right? The, where you are with Christ is going to be equal to your relationship to the Word. So you're, if, you're, if you're saying, you know, why, why is my Christian life not what it should be? It's probably because your relationship to the Word is not what it should be. Right? So the Bible is necessary. Necessary for life. Necessary, first of all, for spiritual life. Right? I know you know that, right? <laughs> Romans ten seventeen for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? You cannot be saved apart from this life-giving Word. Spiritual life hinges on this truth. It's in this book where we learn who God is, where we learn who we are, where we learn what Christ has done, and we learn how to respond to that. That's all here, right? We learn there's this holy, righteous God, and we have sinned against him, rebelled against him, disobeyed his word, deserving God's punishment, deserving his wrath, and yet Christ lovingly came, left the glories of heaven, lived the life that we could not live, died the death that we deserve, and rose victorious over sin in the grave. And we respond. We respond by repentance and faith. That's all here. And it's impossible. This is what the word of God does. Remember, the, the, the words of Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.15, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. This word is able to make you wise to salvation. <laughs> it, 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 the word is not a substitute for Christ. The word leads you to Christ. Right? That's, why, that's why these it's so vital when you're, when you're sharing your testimony that you include Scripture. That's, that's, that's why it's so vital, you know, the, these ministries like seed sowers out there, that we're getting the word of God into the hands of people who do not have it because this word is necessary for life. Not only is it necessary for spiritual life, but it's necessary for spiritual growth, right? I mean, that picture of Matthew 4.4 4 says a lot, right? <laughs> Man shall not live by bread alone, right? We need food to sustain us, right, for health and for life. And, and so but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? So in the same way that food feeds us, nourishes us, this is what the word of God does for us spiritually. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, another familiar picture. The truth is I probably won't tell you much that you don't know tonight, and that's okay (laughs) because we need reminded. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says this, like newborn infants long for the spirit, spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. All right, so we have a correlation here, right? Newborn infants long for spiritual milk. That's the word of God that you may grow into salvation. That word long for, desire, has the idea of intensively craving. There's something that we are, as the people of God, to have a, con- a you know, a consuming desire for. So what is that? Well, it's the milk of the word. Right? It's the word of God. Now, by using that image, Peter's not saying that all, all of his readers, all of his audience here are, are infants, that they're brand new baby Christians. What's he saying? He's saying that in the very same way that a baby desires milk. Does a baby desire milk? Some of you are with me. Some of you are gone. All right? Yeah, right? I mean, a baby desires milk like, you know, and, it, and he's saying the way that that baby desires milk is the way that you and I should desire the word. We should long for it. We should crave it. We all can, can understand that picture. Nothing else will satisfy. Wouldn't it be great if all God's people attacked God's word? You ever, you ever see you know, that baby who, who wants that milk? how they go at it when they finally get it. <laughs> yeah, if we all had that same longing and desire for the word, but you hear it? We need to eat and drink of this word. We need to consume it. Right? Jeremiah said, I have found thy word and I did eat it. Right? This is life and health to our bones. And so think about, think about your spiritual diet. 
You might have to stop and, and, and maybe process a little bit. What are you consuming? What is it that you're taking in? Right? <laughs> because we can't continually take in junk and expect to grow spiritually, right? If you're constantly eating junk food, junk food, junk food, it's going to affect your health. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. Think, think, about, think about how much time you spend plugged into to sources of entertainment and media. You know, has, it ever, has it ever occurred to you that, that by taking in hours and hours, week after week, you know, day after day, that you're consuming, feeding on the world? That's, that's junk food. If we fail, now that, that doesn't mean we can't take in a TV show or do, you know, but we've got to maintain a healthy spiritual diet, right? And, and failure to do so is going to affect your spiritual health. If, if you're not eating properly, there's going to be an effect. And, and, and this is always a good way to think of this, right? If you have no desire for the Word of God, no desire whatsoever, then spiritually you're probably dead, right? Or you're very, very sick. Right? So this is what we would expect, right? When, you, when somebody doesn't have an appetite, right, they're sick, right? There's something wrong. So, if you don't have an appetite for the Word of God, ask yourself, why is that? Why is that? Do, do I have spiritual life at all? Do I know Christ truly? Is there sin in my life that's made you right? right? Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin, right? So, ask yourself those questions. You know, why do we feed on it? That we may grow thereby. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, you know, God doesn't intend for us to remain spiritual Babies, children, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. You can turn if you want. Ephesians 4, 14 says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. What's he say? No longer be children. Grow up. Grow up. That's what he's saying here, right? Don't be tossed to and fro. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, in 1 Peter 2, we see that, right? It says that you taste, you taste the Lord's goodness. And as you're feeding on the Word, you're going to see growth take place. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. If you're feasting on this Word, day in and day out, you will grow. Now, notice the very idea of growth means there's a process. So this goes very much against the grain of our instant gratification, right? Because what do we want? We want everything right now. That's why people are flocking to gas stations buying Powerball tickets, right? Because they, they want it, and they want it right now. Anything to cut corners, right? Shortcut, give it to me now. And, and what do we see within our Christian life? It's not instant, right? If, if you haven't been reading the Word, and tomorrow morning you get up and you read the Word, you're not suddenly going to be boom, super Christian. <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. It's a process. It, there's a growth that's taking place here. Look at verse 15 of, of chapter 4. He says, Rather, speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head into Christ. What's happening? You're growing up to be more and more like Jesus, right? You're growing in wisdom and knowledge and truth and grace and faith and love conformed to the image of Christ. <laughs> but that's a process. In fact, it's a lifelong process. That's what the Bible calls sanctification, right? So necessary for salvation, but necessary for sanctification. Sanctification is simply meaning that there's a process that's taking place where you're being changed into the image of Christ. So you're going to be separated from sin, conform more Christ-like, right? How long does that take? <laughs> Until we see him, right? <laughs> when we see him, we shall be like him. 
Alright, so this is an ongoing process. But what's the primary means by which this sanctification takes place? Do you remember the words of Jesus in John 17, 17? This is his prayer. His prayer for you, for me, and for all of his followers. Sanctify them through thy truth. What's he saying? Lord, I want you to, I want you to set my people apart from sin. Make them more like me, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the primary means of this sanctification is the word. So if you're, if you're not having a regular, steady diet of the word of God, then you're not going to experience sanctification like you should. It's not going to just happen. You must get in the word. Psalm, Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a man keep his way pure? That's that holiness, that sanctification. By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see the the, the importance of the word in this process? See, how does it work? Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? This is what we're talking about, right? This sanctification. There's a transformation process. Spiritual growth is taking place. Becoming more Christ-like. The renewing of your mind. Same, same idea, right? Transformed. As you're in this book, it's going to change the way you think. Now that is, that is vital for us. Because we live in a world that's constantly telling us, this is how you should think. And it's always at odds with what God says in his word. Right? That's why we need, desperately, this, this coming Sanctity of Life Sunday. That's why we do it year after year after year. To continually say, this is what we must say. This is what you must think if you follow Christ about this area of life. Because the world's pushing you in a different direction. And so we, we need that, right? That renewing of our mind. And that happens through the word. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Our time is running short here. Verse 18. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, what do we see? Transformation, right? Being changed from one degree of glory to another. This is like ever-increasing levels of glory. We're experiencing this transformation, becoming more like Christ. This is the goal, right? The goal of getting in the Word of God is not information. The goal is transformation. That's the purpose. If we're not being moved in our heart to new, to new places, to new levels of obedience to God, we're not really reading the Bible the way that God wants us to read it. As we read this word, it should change us. <laughs> change the way we think. Change the way we feel. Right? This is so vital to your Christian life. It's necessary. This progression is taking place. But keep in mind, It doesn't happen in an instant. Go to chapter 4 there and look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed, how often? Day by day. So this renewal, this transformation, day by day. And then Paul says, we do not lose heart. Right? Why do I not lose heart? Because God's working, right? He who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Christ. He's at work. And so we come to this word day by day. It's not a one-time fix, right? This is not going to be, you know, it's not a week at camp or a conference or a sermon. You know, it's not a, you know, you can, you can spend every day this week and then, not come back to the word and that's not going to do it 
you're going to build into your life a culture of feeding on the Word of God. It's that daily gaze. What do we see when we come to the Word? We see Christ. And as we see Christ, we're going to be changed and transformed more into that image. So it's a process, a long process. Not instant, not, there's no magic pill, right? We like shortcuts. You know, unfortunately, it's like exercise, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's what Paul equates it to in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, right? Exercise, train yourself unto godliness. You know, bodily exercise profits a little, right? But godliness is profitable in all things. So you have that, that equation there, right? We, we understand what it, you know, yeah, have you ever, <laughs> you ever kind of got yourself out of shape and then try and get back into shape? And, and, you, and you're like, I used to be able to do this, and now I can't do this. Does that, that happens sometimes spiritually, too. There's a frustration there. <laughs> and you, I, I'm not where I once was. I can't do what I used to do. Right. Well, this happens as we allow ourselves to drift away from the Word. We need it, right? And so it's, there's a training. There's a, you know, if you're going to exercise, if you want to experience the benefit, then you've got you to stick with it. Right? You can't go out this week and work out one day and boom, you know, you've got that beach body. It doesn't work that way, right? We like shortcuts, but they just simply are ineffective. That instant gratification doesn't work in so many areas that matter, that matter. So, as you expose yourself to the Word day after day, week after week, over months and years, and that's what I'm talking about, a commitment to the Word of God, what's going to happen? You're going to look more and more like Christ. There's going to be a transformation taking place. Now, you might say, well, how do I start that? How does that begin? This is what I had in my mind all day. Let's go to James, James chapter 1, because this paints a good picture for us. James chapter 1. In verse 22 to 25. So again, we're coming to the Word, but we're not just coming to the Word to be informed. We're coming to the Word to be transformed. And so verse 22 says, But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So as you're coming to this Word day after day, you want to be asking yourself the question, what do I do? What do I do with what I've read? As you, as you come on Sunday morning and you're going to hear the word preach, you should leave asking yourself the question, what do I do with what I heard today, right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because when we do that, we're deceiving ourselves, right? We're consuming, but there's no transformation taking place. And that spiritual life is not there that we maybe have made ourselves believe is there. It, it, I love the, the picture that he paints, right? Because he says in verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. The word of God is like a mirror, right? I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple illustration. You get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you go, Oh, <laughs> You know, I, I need to comb my hair, and I need to wash my face, I need to shave, I need to brush my teeth, whatever, right? Now, if you look in the mirror, and you see all that, and you just walk away, and you do nothing, that mirror was useless, right? Pointless. You have to act on what you see. So the Word of God works in this way spiritually, in our heart, in our mind. There's going to be times where the Word of God says, Ugh, right? I, I, I need to do something about this. I need to change this. Now, if you walk away from that and you do nothing, what's going to happen? You're going to forget. You're going to forget what kind of man you are. And you're going to continue to walk in that deception. But, look at verse 25. The one who looks into the perfect law, that's the word, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, this is what God wants of his people, Right? We hear the word, we do the word. So we, we're going to invest, we're going we're to give ourselves over, we're going to make a culture of placing ourselves day after day into this word, and then we're going to walk away from it and say, what do I do? God, what do you have for me? 
And what's going to happen? You're going to begin to grow. You're going to transform. You're going to change. The church is going to grow. The church is going to change. God's going to be glorified. People are going to be reached with the gospel. Right? This is what happens when the word of God is actively working in his people. It's necessary. It's vital. And so if you're neglecting that discipline, and it is a discipline, then stop. And you say, well, that's easier said than done. It is. It's hard, right? It's like any other thing we talk about, right? There's diet, exercise. You know, this is not instant, right at your fingertips, shortcut, no shortcuts. It takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes discipline. But, oh, is it worth it? It's worth it. And I know some of you are doing that, and I see that, right? You can see others see that. You're the ones that are going, why am I not growing like them? And well, it's because they're in the Word. And they're feasting upon it. And they're acting upon it. (laughs) So we're going to talk about this a little more, at least one more week, on how we begin to read this word. Because some of you, that's the biggest problem, right? You come to the word, you're going, I just don't know where to begin. I don't know how to study it. I don't know how to read it. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit next time when we come back together. All right? So we'll see if we can help you put a little bit of, feet to what we've talked about. But let's let's close in prayer.